Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I am joined by Daniel Negreanu, who I mentioned, but I have to say first off the bat, thank you so much for your patience and just understanding. I know you have a million things and I really appreciate you making the time for me like 40 times. I'm just hoping that you guys are safe over there with all the craziness going on with the weather. Dude, it is crazy. Legit people are dying. I'm like, I don't even understand what's going on. This is 2021, but I'm just, it's really made me I've just, I've been loving my life. I've been feeling really great having a home and all that stuff. But all of a sudden I'm like, e even next level, like taking a bath room <laughs> and flushing. <laughs> like just the smallest things, it's the best. Um, okay, so we have like so much to cover and I know you don't have that much time. So I wanna first like just get out of the way. It seems like it's already, you know, yesterday's news even though we spent the last like four to five months talking about it on the Poker News podcast, but uh, let's first talk some Doug Polk challenge. Looking forward to now the Phil Youth challenge. We're calling this the year of heads up action. Um, the first thing I guess I wanted to ask you about is just, you guys buried the hatchet. Doug, when we had him on the show and also obviously in his, his YouTubes and his things, he's been very complimentary of you and very, I impressed, I think, by your game. For those of us who know you, I think most of us knew for sure you would put everything into it. But for you coming out, how do you feel, A, about Doug and also about his response and reaction to you and your play? Yeah, I'll say first and foremost, you know, it's reminiscent to me of, well, I'm a hockey guy, right? Often what you see in hockey is you'll see two guys from opposing teams beat the living crap out of each other, just pound each other during the game, right? And then later that evening, you go to the bar and they just finish dinner together and they're having a beer. The two guys who just fought, right? It's kind of like one of those things. There's bad blood, there's this, there's that. It's like, all right, heads up for rolls. Let's go get bloody. And when we're done, hopefully there's a mutual respect for, for the warriors in the ring. Because, you know, one of my favorite quotes is the man in the arena. You know, it's not the critic who counts. And, uh, you know, it's the man in the arena. And, you know, we both stepped in. Obviously, you know, he had an advantage that was clear. Uh, most people in my shoes would never have accepted the challenge. Luckily, I'm in a financial position where I could afford, you know, to, to do so. And I thought it would be really good for my game long term. And I thought, uh, you know, with some hard work, you know, I felt like there was significant improvement available to me, which, which ended up happening. Unfortunately, the result was nowhere near um, what I would have hoped. But, you know, in one retrospect, the journey was worth it because I definitely got a lot better at heads up and in poker in general. Yeah, I think that was clear. And I definitely have way more to talk about on in terms of that and your studying and how your game has has shifted. Um, but before we get too far, I guess, into talking GTO and, and all of these other things, I wanted to ask you, you know, you mentioned one of the reasons that you had, you know, sort of initially just accepted the challenge and said, let's do it is that you were hoping to help kind of promote GG. And you guys weren't able to do that. You know, in hindsight, would you, if you could go back and do it all over again, would you choose to do the challenge again? Well, now I would because I've got the experience, right? Like if I would have to start from scratch and not have learned what I did in the last three, four months and there not being sort of any like, you know, benefit outside of just me losing, which, you know, I'm going to be a big underdog in the match. Not this time. If we did it again, I'd obviously it'd be a lot closer. Um, but no, I mean, that was the, that was the key thought in my mind. I'm like, all right, this will be great. We'll get all the eyeballs in poker on the GG Poker software, watching every day, playing, depositing, we do a bunch of promos around it. Unfortunately, you know, we were short-sighted in thinking that it would be a possibility because the idea was really like, all right, well, we can create, you know, a GG for play money, right? And then we settle up on the side, whether Bitcoin or cash or whatever. And we didn't, then we looked, talked to some lawyers and things and realized, all right, Nevada has regulated online gaming. So this kind of circumvents it, it's clearly, right? So we realized like, bad for GG, bad for us. And now I'm stuck because I've already said, yes, I'll play this match. And I'm like, oh shit, will I be willing to have the egg on my face of saying, you know what? I changed my mind <laughs> and not play. I could have done that, but no, I thought I might as well go through with it. Yeah, that's, that's not your style. That's definitely, definitely not a DNX move. Um, well, one of the things that I think has shifted in, in poker in general, something we've seen a lot at World Series of Poker final tables, is this idea of putting together a team, putting together coaches, people who look at your play. I mean, 
the poker landscape, I think, has changed significantly. And so for you, someone who I think for a long time has been more or less a lone wolf, you've been in this game for a long time doing it by yourself, you compiled a team to help you. Can you talk to me a little bit of, about what it was like, you know, working with your team, how you chose your team? Doug sort of famously said that he, he wouldn't have chose the team that you did, which made me wonder what made you choose them. So that's an interesting question. So when I look back at my history, I've always kind of sort of, I haven't really been a lone wolf. When I grew up, you know, I taught poker with Phil Ivey, John Juan, Alan Cunningham. Of course, the way we broke down hands back then, a lot different than today. Years ago, the late, great uh, Rich Lindacre, who passed away, uh, Tom Marchese um, and the like, who else was the third? Yeah, they, they were like, you know, coaching me when I was playing against Isildur a little bit. So I worked with a couple coaches a couple of years ago and it was really really effective for you know for cash and tournaments and things like that and so i'd already had a relationship with them and you know for me you know i had a lot of faith in their ability to you know break down the numbers and really teach me in a way that i understand because i don't know how like i have the po solver thing i don't know how to do it like i don't i press on and then like okay solve right but the truth is i found out through speaking with you know matt who uh, is really the guy who you know, handles that, that aspect of it is that most people who do solves, like it's a valuable tool, but it's the mass majority of people misuse it. So if you don't put in, it's really complicated. Like, I don't know how to do it. If you don't put in the correct ranges and the correct options for bet sizes or whatever, you'll get an output that's just wrong. Right. So it becomes very intricate. Also these solves take for, you know, some people that don't have a lot of computing power it can take days. And if you don't wait till it's completely finished, you say, Oh, look, it likes this. And like, you didn't wait because the machine was learning. All of a sudden, so it says, oh, you see, I was supposed to call with queen nine. And then you look at, oh, no, it's learning to fold. It's learning to fold. It went from calling 30% to, like, never calling, you know? So learning that whole world, I don't, it's, I needed help with that, you know? Because at the, at the uh, highest stakes now, at the highest levels, poker today, it is so intricate where you can't just half-ass go, YOLO, I'm going to go in there and, like, mix it up. I'll do some donk leading, and I'll just, like, oh, I'll just, like, five check bet them, you know? <laughs> do all this stuff, like... It's just not a thing. You got to learn how to play the game properly. So I know that obviously there was a lot of money on the line. Anyways, there's, you know, bragging rights, these things, but for the most part, I know for you guys, a lot of the times there's a lot of side action. Is that something that you were participating in? Is that something you can talk about? I was very minimal because I didn't care. You know, I didn't need extra motivation, you know, to, to play well or do my best. So I took a very small piece because Bill Perkins bet a lot on it. So he's like, all right, well, you know, he wanted me to have some incentive to continue past 12-5 because I could have just, you know, waved the white flag at 12-5 and said, all right, good game, GG, <laughs> GG. <laughs> and uh, so, but, you know, so he kind of gave me some incentive, gave me like 10 to 1 on 10K or something like that, just a little extra carrot. Um, so, yeah, the side action wasn't really a thing for me, but I still did want to win the match. Like, if I had an opportunity, for example, let's say I had an opportunity where I'm up 50,000, okay, and I can fold out 50,000 and win $1, giving them the fifty thousand one dollar winner yes i'll take it <laughs> i i know that's your style and you know i think for most of us looking at the whole thing it just seemed like an ungodly amount of work which you clearly did and you know as i was watching some of your post-match stuff and listening to you know what doug had said after the challenge you said sort of towards the end obviously the only way to win was to take a lot more risky plays and to really go kind of crazy and you felt that this was kind of terrible poker and it was interesting because Doug said he thought your poker just kept getting better and better in terms of you know playing heads up so I wanted to see if now looking more on it like what are your thoughts now do you think Doug so, is right do you think playing crazy like that is so, he, so here's the thing right and I'll I can reveal this now post-game interviews I think both on his part and my part were somewhat misleading you know, I wasn't always exactly telling it how it was, right? Like there were moments where I'd watch, cause he knows I'm watching his and he knows I'm watching mine. So he would say things like, he can't get it. He needs to stop folding so much in these spots. He can't win folding this much. I'm like, hmm, I wonder why he's telling me that, right? Like, is that genuine? Is that honest? And if so, why would he tell me that? So there's like leveling going on, you know, in the post games. So one of the things that I'd said many times throughout the post game was that I was like looking to play as close to GTO as possible. Well, that's not true. I mean, I was trying to play GTO in most places, but what I'm try also trying to do, I figured to beat him, I was going to have to take advantage of his, his biggest weaknesses, right? Or his, maybe not even his tendencies, okay? 
So let's say GTO is alive, right? Like say the number is 50, that's GTO, right? And then someone who, you know, calls too often or, you know, calls more often than 50, uh, let's say they call 60 when they're supposed to call 50, right? Against that player, if they call too much, which is his tendency and has been for most of his career, whatever, if you under bluff in spots like that against that player, you will actually gain value. And in, in, a lot of, in a lot of ways that actually did work quite well because I was still getting some calls from him that were incorrect from a GTO perspective. So for a lot of it, I didn't really need to balance uh, my bluffs because he was just calling anyway. Like, I mean, he called me with, when I saw, he called me with ace king, no diamond on three, four, five, six, nine with three diamonds. And I went, I bet the turn and jammed the river. Like I, I could have said, you got it. I have a pair of threes and you'd be like, good, you know? Um, so he made a lot of really light calls, maybe earlier in the match to set up the, the meta, if you will. And then I started to open it up because when he started limping, I don't know whether it was by design or not, he started folding now at you know specific spots and main lines. So of course, much like in football, uh, you take what the defense gives you, right? So now he's opened up some bluff lines. I still, what people don't realize, and I was gonna do content, but I don't know if it's too much of a process. I, I did what I call a lot of bougie bluffs, okay? A bougie bluff isn't just like bet, you know? A bougie bluff is like call turn with ace high when the board is four, four, three, three, and then check, and then the river's a three, check, he bets, check, raise the river. You know, like a weird kind of bougie bluffs, like bougie bluffs or three bet the river after overbetting. There was one early on when all the guys were like, oh, no teenage, must have had it here. I bet my left testicle. Well, apparently the guy has little tiny testicles anyway, so it, it wouldn't be much of a bet. But uh, it was a spot where it came like uh, queen jack three. And then the turn was a four and the river was a deuce. I bet the flop, check the turn. And on the river, deuce three, four, queen jack. He checked, I overbet the river, okay, it was five, seven. He check raised, I have the worst possible head. I re-raised, right? Because I felt like, you know, that was a good bougie bluff. So bougie bluffs were always a part of it. But a lot of mainline bluffs, I felt like his tendency was to overcall to a certain degree. I was also, it was also one other thing I was doing uh, at certain points in the match. I was overfolding in some spots because the way that he was constructing his ranges, like especially early on with the overbets, he was taking a lot of value into the overbet lines. And this is very technical stuff. He was taking value into the overbet lines that GTO says you're not supposed to do. So like GTO says, okay, you can bet two thirds pot here, but you can't bet one and a half. He was betting one and a half. So when that happens, right? When someone takes way more value to their overbets, what that means is the ratio of value to bluffs is even more magnified. So against that, he's way less likely to be bluffing if he also has value combos that he's not theoretically supposed to have. So in a lot of those big spots, everyone's like, oh, Daniel always folds the river. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, it's just correct in a lot of spots. And every time I did call, it seemed like he had it. Like, oh, king's up. You have better king's up. Cool. Very nice. Actually, I felt like I got cooler an insane amount of times throughout the entire match. But, uh, you know, such is life. Well, and I think even Doug had said, you know, after 25,000 hands, it is whatever it is. But had you guys continued that the the margin of, you know, difference between your guys' play was just getting smaller and smaller. I know that you had less time to prepare because you're also busy playing the the main and things on GG, which he, he openly admitted, you know, I got like a, at least a month jump on Daniel. And so, you know, you you talked a little bit about how much you've learned. And it's interesting because I remember even a few years ago after, you know, playing with the Germans at maybe the Super High Roller Bowl, you were one of the players who came out and said like, these guys are just sickos. I want to, you know, get better, do better, which you did and have. And I think this heads up no limit game is just one that for the most part, most players just don't have the time or energy to get deep into. You have now and you and Phil are maybe you guys are, you're confirmed, I guess, to do a heads up challenge against each other. And this is such an interesting spot because first of all, I think now everyone, like the lines are so far on you uh, because of the last few months. I guess first, let's just start with this. What would you put the lines at now for you and, and Phil? Well, it depends on what the match looks like, right? So first and foremost, you know, and I, I obviously got a lot better at heads up, but even bef even day one, you know, if I were to play Phil Helmuth based on the way that he plays and I play, I was going to beat him anyway. Like I'd be a favorite anyway. Now that I've got a lot more, you know, advanced knowledge and, you know, theory uh, on heads up, it's just even, even bigger of a favorite. Now, Phil would never in his right mind, like he talks a big game, but he's completely full of shit. Oh, he says, I'm going to play Doug Polk. I'm ready. No, you're not. 
You were not going to play Doug Polk and he goes, I'm going to limp 90% of buttons. And, oh, and Doug's going to go, oh, I'm so scared. What am I going to do? You limped every head. Ooh, oh, you know? So he was never going to play that. So I was like, I, I want to play him a 25,000 hand match, right? Like, because that's really a test where, you know, you're more like, you just get, it's a bigger hand sample, right? So we're not going to be playing that. What we'll play is a high stakes duel, similar to what he did against Antonio, which could, you know, it's got deep, it starts with like 500 big blinds, which is good for me. So it starts really, really deep. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's got enough structure and play. Like Phil does a good job of kind of avoiding situations typically where he's going to be really, really exposed because deep stack play is not going to be his forte. He makes the most of his mistakes come deep stack. He just it can't win. Like, so the way that I foresee the match actually going is I'll get, I'll build up a lead. And the only way that he'll be able to win is if near the end, when we're short stack, you know, he wins a few all ins. but I don't see, I don't see much of a chance for him winning. I would say with as many chips as we have, I would make myself like two and a half two two, like between two, two and a half to one favorite. And according to Jeff, right now you're like a three to one favorite on most the the betting sites and but of course we understand like doing a three rounds or whatever it's a completely different situation and you know there's been a lot of interesting things some of the interviews i heard you give or i think this was actually on uh the dat poker podcast with with your guys own podcast uh, talking about some after the first live match with you and doug that uh, everyone had said, oh, he literally always folds the turn, but that you were, you know, using these randomizers, you were just doing what you were supposed to be doing. And so I was kind of thinking, looking at you and Phil doing these live, this live heads up together, you have your own style, obviously, you have 30 years of, or I don't know, 30 years, I'm guessing, of, you know, poker experience behind you which you even admitted you had to like turn off for a lot of this heads up challenge. So now looking at this heads up challenge with Phil, how much do you feel like you're going to be relying on this GTO and what you've learned, you know, from this experience versus, you know, sort of going back to the, I, I'm going to probably win anyways with my, my own mm -hmm. poker knowledge right. from before. So before, you know, this update, you know, I'm, I'm a, mostly an exploitative player. Uh, Phil Hellmuth is extremely exploited. He doesn't do anything GTO, nothing standard. He's completely his own brand and his own ideas and everything like that, right? I felt like exploitatively I was going to be able to destroy that because I know, you know, how to. Now, when you add in like sort of GTO baseline principles, especially deep stack, like that being the starting point, it allows a lot of situations to be very, very easy for me. Um, but mostly, I think where probably one of the bigger edges lies is my learning because when I started the match with Doug, I had two bet sizes. That's it, either twenty percent a pot or seventy-five percent a pot. That's limiting. That's not good. It's I mean, if you were a GTO robot, you can make that work. I'm not. Um, but once I started to be able to introduce more sizes, over bets, two-thirds pot, one-third pot, forty percent, all these different things in different spots, I feel like that's going to be where my biggest edge is because Phil. His bet sizing, especially deep stacks, is, is kind of all over the map. Well, it's not all over the map, it's just bad. Like it's kind of, I don't want to give away too much, but it, it's not good, okay? It's not going to, so like with Doug, Doug put me in a lot of like incredibly tough spots. 4X pot the river. Holy shit. But he's doing it where he's, you know, balancing bluffs. So now you're sitting there with top pair and you're thinking, oh boy, okay, big deal. I have top pair. He just bet, you know, 40,000 into 10,000. Am I supposed to just call with top pair and pray? Because it's just a bluff catcher, right? If he's bluffing, I win. If he's not, I never win. So that becomes a much more complicated, uh, you know, formulaic situation where you have to break down whether or not you're supposed to call, what hands call, what hands fold. With Phil, he's not going to be doing stuff like that, right? You're not going to see Phil like on a four straight board, like 4X bottom river. There was a hand I folded against Doug. The board was ace, deuce, three, six. Ace, deuce, three, four, six, Okay. He checked on the river. I have a five. I have a straight. Okay. I bet a little bit. One third pot. You know, little cutesy one. I bet like three big blinds total. You know what he did? He check raised to 167 big blinds. <laughs> so you're sitting there and you have a straight, right? And you think, well, I guess I'm supposed to call, right? But you're not just supposed to call because when he does that, he's usually going to have a five, which is a straight with you. And a lot of the time he's going to have a seven with it, which for the better straight, which means you're just, you know, you're punting. So spots like that, you're just not going to face against Phil. Like he doesn't have that kind of repertoire. He has a very, he hasn't really, to be honest with you, adapted or updated his game 
in the 20 years I've known him. Like he still kind of does the exact same stuff. And to his credit, to his credit, it still works against a lot of people because they fall for it. I think, like I said earlier, like if he played against, you know, the Wizards at the high stakes, like none of his little antics would work. It's just, they'll just, they'll just be just too much to overcome the fundamental, uh, you know, weaknesses. It's interesting. It's something that Doug said that I really took to heart in thinking about my own self. He said, you should always bet big on yourself because, well, if you know yourself and you know you're going to work really hard, then you would always bet big on yourself because you know how hard you're going to work at it. And I was thinking that you probably also could always say, yeah, I'm always going to bet on myself because I know I'm going to work super hard. And uh, no disrespect to Phil, but I was actually thinking the same thing. I was wondering, would Phil say to himself, I'm going to work as hard or harder than Daniel? And the answer, I guess we're saying is probably not. Well, you know, it's Phil. Phil does this thing, right? And he said he said he does this every possible time he has. It's a way of him. So here's how he tries to like sort of insult me and demean me in a way, but it's very passive aggressive. He does this. He's, it's a spiel. It goes like this. He's like, I know Daniel's coaches. They, they're brilliant guys. And they came to me, you know, and we agreed on a lot of the concepts and everything. So I thought to myself, well, you know, what can they teach me? But it's great for Daniel, right? As though, oh, Daniel, dumb. I could learn from people. But like Phil couldn't possibly learn anything from the younger generation. And that's sort of one of the bigger differences between him and I. I'm from that era, the golden era, 2004 or whatever, right? Not many people are left from that era still relevant today because a lot of them were stuck in like, this is how to play. And they don't look at the young guys and say, you know what, what are they doing better than me? I've always done that. I've always shown a deep respect for like the young grinders. Like I always believe that Sure, when you make it, the hardest thing to do is stay there because there's always younger people grinding it out. Like Rocky Rocky Three, I, I, I mentioned this before, but Rocky Three, he's already the champ. You know, he's taking pictures, doing sponsorships, blah, blah, blah. You know, Clubber Lang is sweating, grinding in the gym and just destroys him, right? And there's a lot of parallels there. And that's why I watch the movies every year. There's a lot of parallels to poker, right? And I've always looked at these young guys and have, I'm like, they're in the trenches, bro. They're like, you know, 10, 12 hours a day with solvers and playing and grinding. Like, how dare you, frankly, how dare you think that you can just like never study poker, but have an edge over people at the highest levels, you know, on a regular basis. And he does it without actually ever playing against them. He just talks like he could beat them, right? So that for him, that's just good enough. And he's always careful about manipulating the public perception, right? Because we know there's diehard poker players who all know the nitty gritty. They know the Jason Coons and the Stephen Chidwicks and the limit. Those guys are the killers. And they know like me and Phil, we're like, we're good for our time. But we're not, you know, we're not good. But most people still think Phil Helm is the best. <laughs> like he's the best ever, you know? And it's like his results, the World Series of Poker, you got to clap. They're amazing, you know? But to suggest that, uh, you know, in this day and age, with the people in their prime working in, in, and playing at their best that, you know, him or I, and I'll, I'll use myself, um, are at that level without the work it's just it's just frankly it's delusional to think that could you like, you just can't imagine like how could you possibly be on the level when you don't even understand even at a base level what they're studying you just think you know it but you've never even seen it like what he said about the match with me he said i didn't like the way daniel played you know how many hands he watched zero he didn't watch any of it but said i didn't like the way daniel played that's just fast. See, that's what I'm talking about. Like, where, how do you do that? How do you, how do you say like, oh, that movie, I hated it. Did you watch it? No, didn't watch it, but it was terrible. Got it. Okay. That's, you're real credible then as a source. <laughs> or maybe Mike Madison told him I didn't play well. So he's like, they're the guru, you know? <laughs> Jeff even mentioned it before we did this interview. He said, well, Phil did mention in the interview that he never actually watched any of the match, which I think it's, Really interesting. And, and you've touched on something actually a few times in this interview that made me think, um, I was just on a podcast with Marley Cadero and she actually said she really loves a lot of the content that you've been doing. And, but that what people don't realize about you uh, is that of course, a lot of what you're doing is like a shtick or a character or something. This is like the Daniel that we see and you might be a completely different person behind closed doors. Obviously, Phil Hum Youth has a shtick. Everyone, I have a shtick, everyone has it. Um, and this might be like kind of weird and intense, but I know the kind of guy you are. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how much is like the shtick? You have to do the post-match interviews and whatever, but how much of what we are seeing is really you? 
I would say it's all really me, like as genuine as you could ever imagine. And I, what I will say is this though, I think maybe you can relate to like, you know, when you're on, like you're on now, right? You're working, you know, you know, when you're with your friends at the bar, you might like, you know, be a little different, right? When I'm promoting some, I'm like, Hey, I'm Dan Abranu here for GG Poker, bringing it to you live from the Dean Egg's house. We got flipping goes. So that's, you know, that's promoter style, right? But what I feel like through, I mean, when I'm, when I'm in the right environment, like when I'm playing on this chess.com tournament, right? I know there's a lot of young kids watching this. So I'm not cursing and, you know, doing that, right? When I'm doing my streams on my Twitch or, you know, I'm playing the post games, like when I'm freaking out and going and pissed off, that's genuine in the moment. Like I can laugh at myself because I'm like, I look at that behavior and I think, what an absolute fool. Like I laugh at it. Like when I'm smashing the laptop, like, ah, oh, you idiot. Like, I think that most people can relate to that because they felt it, right? The difference is like, I'm pretty comfortable. Well, no, I'm very comfortable in my own skin. So there is a part of my personality that is engaging and fun loving and, you know, good with people and, you know, positive or whatever. But then I get pissed off too. And I get angry and I don't pretend this, I've actually got a big problem with like, and I'm not going to name any names, but there's sort of this submerging culture in poker where everyone's got this Instagram life. Ah, oh, perfectly poshed. And then they've got fucking quotes up the wazoo, like 18 paragraphs of like, I'm so hashtag blessed to live in gratitude. Of the, like, oh my God, I get it a little bit here and there, but like every one of your posts, like it's too much now. Meanwhile, what are you doing? Like crying in a bowl of cereal at 1am about how depressed you are? Like, listen, it's okay to be raw and real. It's okay to have bad days. It's okay not to have it all figured out. And when you actually act like you've got it all figured out, people find it patronizing, I think for the most part. And it's like, listen, if I wanted a guru, I would tell you. And I've gotten accused of that in my lifetime. You know, I'm a vegan, right? I've learned to be not militant about it. Like that's me, not everybody else's, but I'll share my thoughts on it. I'm not saying you have to go vegan or whatever like that. Or I've had things that have worked in my life that I share with other people. I'm like, hey, listen, I like to set goals. I like to do this. I do that. I share that. But I don't try to come from a place of like condescension where I'm telling you what you need to be doing. Because I think a lot of these like faux enlightened people are, um, they're just faking it till they make it in a lot of ways. And I don't think that's necessarily bad for them because they need that. But I think that there is this like phony cutout picture of the word amba poker ambassador. What's a poker ambassador? What the fuck is a poker ambassador? What is that? It's the stupidest term ever. Like when someone says ambassador, I go, you're an ambassador? Like for what country? What do you do? What is your role as ambassador? You know, what heads of state do you speak with? Like, listen, you're a poker player. You're playing a grungy game, right? CD, old school. That's the way the game got popular. The game didn't get popular because we were talking about different ranges and charts and pre-flop. Game was popular because Sam Grizzle and Mike Mattiso and Sean Chacon almost got in a fight. Parade Friedman accused the guy of getting an ante and he almost punched him in the head. Clash is war. That's what these heads up duels like myself with Doug with Phil Helmuth, I think that's like, that's the sweet spot. And this purity contest, you know, in poker, we're like, oh, oh, we have to say, you know, hero and villain, don't say he because women play poker too. And she, it's like, hold the fucking phone, bro. You know, it's too much sometimes. But anyway, like I don't surround, I don't have people in my life like that. And my wife, she probably more than anybody, she hates that more than I do. Like she's, she's raw and real, you know, like, you know, she's like, this is some bullshit right here. And I'm like, oh, they're just trying to be like, she's like, oh, like she's, she's the one who hates when people do like hashtag blessed. It's like, well, good for you. You know, good for you. It's, it's too much. So I don't live that world. Like I've got warts, right? People have seen them. I've cursed. I've had some cock fucks. I've had some, you know, different things like that. I've had some fine moments and I've had some not so good moments, but that's really who I am. You know, I can be, here's the thing. I learned this too when I did this course fucking on emotional intelligence, like Choice Center years ago. I learned that like, okay, there are multiple parts of who I am, right? And when I'm in my worst, when I'm in my survival mode, I'm angry, like I, I can be arrogant, I can be condescending, I can show like a lack of empathy or caring for other people and stuff like that. That's me at my worst, right? That's not all of who I am, but that's certainly something I struggle with, humility. What I wanna be is I wanna be caring, humble, you know, accepting of people, not so judgmental, kinder, all that kind of stuff. So I have that. But this is part of me too. And I'm not going to pretend this part doesn't exist because that's bullshit. We all have, you know, our best selves and we have moments where we're not our best selves. And I think it's important to embrace all those things, work on it. Like I don't want to be a jackass all the time, but I'm going to be a jackass sometimes and you're not going to like it and you're going to try to cancel me, you know, but it's not going to work because there's nothing to cancel. What do I, I already got money. I got the wife that I always dreamed of. I got a house. If you don't like what I'm doing, Hey, how about this? If you don't like it, 
What's your th- saying? <laughs> Don't listen. Yes, exactly. But you know what's amazing to me too? Like, it seems like the people who are most critical of me, right? Dissect every little thing I say and watch me all the time. Like, if you hated somebody, would you spend all of your days obsessed with everything they do or just change the channel? Yeah. There's plenty of poker streams, plenty of things you can do outside of this. If you don't like me, that's fine. I probably don't like you anyway. And I really, like, how many people do you have in your life, Sarah? Or, or you know, they're like, man, I wish that, I really like that person. I wish they liked me. Yeah. I've got zero. I don't yeah. know about you. Yeah, it's crazy. And I, like, I couldn't be more on Amanda's, you know, train or your train. I think we're de- you're definitely speaking to the choir. And, you know, I think, you know, what's interesting is someone was asking me once, uh, recently, like, what, what do I think people are looking for in content? What do people really want to watch? And really what they want to watch are your weaknesses. They want to see your vulnerabilities. They want to see you fail. And actually, I think it's because those are the things that are the most relatable. Those are the things that we can see in someone and say, even though that person is my idol, they also fart or whatever. And that is, is I think, helpful for humanity more than this, like, oh my gosh, I'm your idol. And also my life is so perfect and everything is perfect. And you're a hundred percent right. Those people are fully crying in their bathrooms. At two well, then here's the thing. I think the mistake a lot of people make is they think of vulnerability as, you know, crying, yeah. like sad, depressed. Like, you know what me being vulnerable is? It's like you seeing me post-match yelling, this fucking guy, I can't make a fucking straight. I got 10 Jack, Queen, King. I got a fucking flush draw. This fucking guy fades every hand. He's running so hot. That's me being vulnerable. Because, you know, I know, I know, I know how to not be that. Okay. Yeah. If I chose to have the per, I could have been like, well, you know, uh, frustrating uh, match today. You know, felt like things could have gone a little bit better. But like, you know what? That's fake. What vulnerable and honest and real is is you seeing me totally losing my shit. And you're right about one thing. And I've, like I said, I it's uh, what do you call love hate? People either you typically love me or they hate me. Um, and you know, for the same reason, some people hate me, others enjoy it. just the fact that I'm willing to be myself and open and honest. And some people don't like what that looks like. Hey, that's okay. Like I said, if I'm not your cup of tea, plenty of other opportunities for you to, you know, watch poker and learn from people. And I can do the interview for you then, by the way, too, if you want to just be that way, I can just tell you like, you know, you got really lucky in a lot of spots and you feel really like grateful to have have won this tournament. And I I definitely, I feel like the same with this sort of scrum, the post-match football games where I don't even watch the stuff, but I know it's like, oh, it was the team, like good job team or whatever. Nobody wants to hear this. They, if you can write it yourself, you don't want to hear oh, I mean, that's the, the, the cliche sports team. You know, we gave it 110% today. It was a team effort. There's no I in team, you know, we just go out there every shift and give it our best and, you know, play, you know, take it one step at a time, one game at a time. So you literally just said absolutely nothing. 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 You want to see you that guy nothing. be like, I'm so pissed, dude. Like this is the worst game ever or whatever. The, the, the people that the yeah. people that make a mark in this world are typically the ones that go off script and they actually say what they what they will. I'm a hockey guy, so I listen to guys like Drew Doughty. So Drew Doughty, you know, he had a kind of a not a great game recently, you know, about a week ago or whatever. And at the end of the game, you know, the team lost and he's like, you know, how, how, what do you think you could have done differently? What do you, you know, how do you think you played? And he's like, he's like, um, I think I dominated. Uh, every aspect of the game. I don't think there's any way I could have possibly played any better. And he's joking, right? But he's like, he's like, he's like, fuck you for the question, right? Like, you know, so I like people that are honest, genuine, real. It's, you know, and there's a lot of people, like I look at a guy like Lex Feldhaus and I, I, I've always, you know, had a good relationship with him and friendly. And I think that he's raw and real and always love him. But then there's some people that I've known in my life for a long time who have sort of morphed into unrecognizable people. Like I know them, away from what I see on their social media. But then when I look at them, I'm like, who is this person? Because they're completely full of shit. I'm with you. And, it, and I think the, sad, the saddest part of it is that I don't think it's just poker. I think it's sort of a cultural phenomenon. I think this is the new thing. It's now for everybody to just be the best version of themselves all the time and always be telling everyone else how shitty they're doing and how they're not living up to the virtues of the now. And I honestly, it drives me insane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It drives me insane. And so, and I, I just appreciate that about you. I, I did make this compilation of, you know, you losing it, which I had so much fun doing because it's fun and it's interesting for me. I do a lot of stuff that's not so interesting. And, but I did try to start the video with you saying, this is not PC. I'm not here to, you know, be <laughs> your politically correct person. This is just me saying what I want. And I, I appreciate that. I, I personally value that a lot. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm excited to see how this 
Phil thing goes down. Um, I think we all are. And anything else like that you're working on before I let you go or that you want to, you know, share with people? Well, yeah, like I wanted to share real quickly that like, so my life's always about it, like some sort of goal or, or journey. When people use the word journey, you know, it's like, oh, but no, really journey makes sense in this place. Like I always look to strive to do something new. So when the Doug match was over, that's a chapter that's closed. And I gotten into chess. So I'm kind of devoting similarly, the same sort of devotion I, to this chess tournament. I was invited to the Pog Champs 3. For those that aren't familiar, it's a chess tournament with not like super experts, but it's like, you know, famous people, whether they're streamers you've never heard of because you're not a gamer, like, you know, Pokemon and XQC and The Beast and Rubius and all these people. And then you got Rain Wilson, who was uh, on The Office. You got Logic the Rapper and you got yours truly from the poker world. So I was invited to play in this chess tournament and I'm not very good, but I've won my first two matches in group play and I have uh, a match on Saturday. So I'm very excited about that. It's, it's a lot of fun to step out of your, your element and, you know, into a different world. And the, the viewership's insane, okay? But again, as I said, I know that it's a different audience. Like this is chess, right? Like a lot of kids. So I'm not, there's no cock fucks in that, right? Like if poker news, if people are offended by that, then like they, they would have turned you off a long time ago. That much I know. So I feel like we're safe here. But yeah, so that's been a lot of fun. You know, that's been my newest thing. And then when I'm done with this, because it'll end in, in, in Mar you know, from March 1st, I guess, I will, uh, I'll start, you know, planning ahead to play Phil Hellmuth in the high stakes duel um, on TV. And I'm, you know, looking forward to that. I think the way the format works is if like, here's the thing. I think you have to accept two rematches. So like if for him, he'd have to win three in a row to beat me. That's like 80 to one. Okay. So for him, cause I'm not going to say no to a rematch. Right. So let's say he does beat me the first time I'm playing him again. He beats me again. I'm playing him a third time and he has to double the stakes every time. So I'm going to get his money sooner or later. I don't know if he will ask for a rematch against me, but we shall see. But I want to say too with him, I love Phil away from the table. He's great, funny, cracks me up. He's a great personality. He's my favorite person to watch play poker on TV. Um, but I've always had like a fun time needling him, bringing him back to reality and mocking him for his delusion. But I do so, I think for the most part in a fun loving way, you know, sometimes maybe we cross the line, but he comes at me too with these passive aggressive jabs. Like all oh, these coaches. Yeah. Well, I mean, I obviously didn't meet them because I already know everything. But I thought for Daniel, you know, they're brilliant minds. So they're probably brilliant because they said, yeah, Phil, I like that. And he's like, oh, well, there you go. Got it figured out. <laughs> you know, you got one concept, maybe you're right. So anyway, I'm looking forward to it. I expect a lot of fun jabber. Uh, unlike the Doug match where I expected it to be, I didn't know what to expect well, during the live portion. I didn't know if we were going to go, you know, bloody or, in, or what. But, you know, we ended up being friendly. And I'd say that like, I mentioned this before, but the one thing I learned, if I could go back, right? Because there's always learning experience to how the whole thing happened with me and Doug, right? And go back and change something. I would change one specific thing. He was a young up and comer, right? Making content, all this kind of stuff. He did some things I didn't like about, you know, with Jason Mercier and friends of mine. I was like, this is way out of line. What I should have done, considering my place in poker and my role of ambassadorship or whatever the case may be, what I should have done was actually just reached out to him and had a conversation with him and explained to him why, you know, this isn't ideal and do this and that. And I think it would have like left the flames down. But for him, he's a guy who's got a team behind him, which is like really good at making videos, right? So like they come at you. So I think for him, he felt slighted. He felt attacked by me. And it was really more a case of me not accepting, you know, his contributions to in, in the ways that he was packaging it. Cause I knew some of his, his content was good. I just felt like the personal jabs of people and the attacks were totally unnecessary because his content is good and stands on its own. You know, he didn't need, he didn't need the clickbait stuff. Right. But I, as I said, what I think I learned is that, um, because I was older, you know, I should have been the adult and, you know, earlier on just been like, cause the truth was for years, even when we had this beef, anytime I saw him in public, he was like super nice to me. He's like, Hey, how's it going? And I'm like, fuck you, dude. <laughs> like, you just made a video of freaking dildos in my mouth and <laughs> shit with a posted a picture where I got three hairs on my head and fucked up teeth. And like, and you want to just like chat, like, come on, bro. But it just told me that, you know, a lot of it for him, I think was shits and giggles and stick and it, it got heated, but I'm glad that that chapter's closed. And, uh, you know, we were very civil since then, you know, we even chatted about playing me some chess games here and there, not for money. We're not doing a chess challenge. I'm don't lower that shit with him. 
But uh, who knows? Maybe next year we'll do a poker one again. I mean, I think, I hope that that's in general. A, first, like with you and Phil, I think we should be allowed to say, hey, I think that this about this person, but also they're my friend. I respect them on these other levels. Like, I just feel like we should be able to say things sometimes that are less than <laughs> gracious about people because these are truths and we can still be friends with them. And I, I did say this to Doug, I think, um, I've learned a few things from my husband about uh, respect and what you know that means to men in it's a little bit different for a woman, I think, to understand how important that is. But exactly like you said, like two fighters who go into the ring who afterwards, you know, can shake hands and be friends. I think both you and Doug must have respect for each other. And I think especially for men, if you have that foundation, you can clearly move on, move forward, leave it in the ring and and keep going. And I'm never 100% sure kids these days like live their lives in the content creation. So sometimes I'm not even sure what's real, right? Like, are they, are they really like wanting to be for, do they just want to make a video that gets clicks? It's really hard to tell. Yeah, you know, another thing to his credit, and it's something I appreciate, we talk about people that are, you know, genuine or whatever. Like, he really, I mean, so here's the thing. He, he will say whatever he thinks is true, unapologetically, openly, and whatever. Um, I was going to say, like, he gives zero shits about what people think. That's not true. He clearly cares what people think, but it doesn't stop him from saying or doing what he believes in, right? Because, like, you can tell. I mean, you, you can just tell. Like, for example, the whole luck thing, you know, and I was like, I'm, yeah, I'm fucking unlucky, da-da-da. And he was like, no, you're not, you know, da-da-da. Like, then that's just ego talking, right? It was my ego saying, shit, you're, you know, you've been lucky. And then it's his ego saying, no, I'm just better, right? It's like, you know, just that's who we are. So he definitely cares about what people think. But to his credit, he, it doesn't stop him. Like, he doesn't have a, an overlord boss who is like making sure that he stays, you know, no, he's not, he's non-cancelable, I guess. People that are self-made and, you know, create their life the way that they do, they're not cancelable. You can't, like, especially in today's day and age. I mean, you, you know, there's YouTube, there's all these different platforms, you can get your message out. So what we see in the mainstream, I think, you know, if you're an actor or if you actually are an influencer and stuff like that, you know, I guess it would matter. But if you've made, you've made your money, you know, you got your perfect wife that you're happy to have, you got your life, like, who cancel this? <laughs> cancel you, you go cancel, cancel this. Eat a sausage. <laughs> I'm so with you. And I, I 100% agree that I also think, you know, I think it's, it's hard for anyone to really say that they don't care at all what other people think. I think it's human nature to care, but the, the people that matter, I think, are the people who do care somewhat what people think, but don't let it stop them from doing and saying what they believe. And really, I think Phil's like that. I think you're like that. I think Doug's like that. I think a lot of the people that you see rise to the top of the, I don't know, fame charts, if you will, in, in poker and in the world are, are the people that, that just say I what will they say this. think. And it's because- I will like say this, it. there was an evolution for me, because I know for most of my life, I definitely cared. You know, I cared because this, you know, you're, as you're young, you're making a name and all this stuff matters to you, right? Since I, you know, got married, and my wife, she has like a really positive effect on me in this regard. Because I realize like, all I really give a shit about is what she thinks of me. And she's got my back in every situation, whether I'm right or wrong. And I've actually evolved to a place where, you know, the hate, the Twitter comment, none of that. I give zero, like literally zero shits. Like I laugh now. Like, in, I mean, I laughed anyway, but now I can really like take it to the next level laughing when people come at me with stuff. Like, and I come back with some really childish, a little puppy. I come back with some, I come back with some childish retorts occasionally because it's fun and I don't give a shit. Like Ryan Fifi, okay? If you're listening, little Fifi, little Fifi with the little pinky, okay? Little pinky dick, little Fifi. So little Fifi came at me and obviously it's very immature to mock the guy because he has a small little pinky penis, right? You know, because it's not his fault, right? It's not his, it's just not his fault. But, but I thought it was funny and it's stupid and it's childish and I don't give a shit. If you don't like it, don't listen, <laughs> but you know, and if you don't like it, Fifi, there's a support group for people with pinky dicks and there's also pumps and different things you can do, you know, and there's other, no, there's other ways to please a woman as well. So you're not, you know, it's not all lost for you anyway. So how immature did we finish that on? Yes. Dude, I'm with you though. And yeah, and I, I do understand. And I think too, even like now having kids, it's very, very much changed my perspective on the amount of fucks given about what other people think because 
yeah, I think as you build your own family, you care mostly about your family. And I think that's human. I think it's just human. Um, and it's exhausting too. It's yeah. exhausting to keep up and care with what the narrative is. And that's why my concern is for teenagers growing up in this world right now, because they live in social media world. We're like, you know, likes and comments and all this stuff. It's like, it defines them to a certain degree. If, if you're not careful, I think a lot of ways it does like, you know, increased number of like suicides, especially young, amongst young, you know, young girls who now people can sit behind a keyboard, say awful things to this person who maybe is not equipped to deal with that emotionally or, or whatever, spiritually, whatever you want to say. And, um, you know, it's sad, like it, it's unfortunate. And there's really no putting this back in the can. Social media is here to stay. We're not getting rid of it. So we're going to have to learn to teach our kids to toughen up. No more safe space bullshit, right? We teach them young. Life is hard. You're going to fall down. You're going to scrape your knee. People are going to call you a fat, stupid fuck. People are going to call you whatever they want, all this kind of shit. You know, that's, don't take it personal. That's their opinion. Just say, thanks for the feedback. Don't let it define you, right? And that's, I think, like for this next generation coming forward, the most important lesson they can learn because we're coddling this generation to a certain degree. And it's not their fault at all. There's a book called the Coddling of the American Mind that specifically discusses this and how if we don't let kids feel the emotional pain, by you know, hiding them from trigger warnings and all this kind of stuff. When they do in the real world, they won't be equipped, right? When you want to gain muscles, you break the muscles down, you tear them down so that they build stronger for the next time. If you don't build up your emotional, you know, tolerance for all this kind of namesake stuff and like you know, people making fun of you or whatever, it can be literally, it can be a, like a death sentence for a lot of these kids because they're totally not prepared. So enough with the trigger warnings, enough with the safe spaces. Let's move towards like getting people to understand what the real world looks like. Prepare them. What is it? Don't try to prepare the road for the kid. Prepare the kid for the road. Yes. And also that they're going to be afraid to be themselves, to say things that people don't like, to be offended. And then we're going to, and then it's terrifying to think we will live in a, in a world where the politicians and the great leaders of the world are all afraid to do anything or say anything that matters because they just want to make sure they fall in line and don't get called out for, you know, saying the wrong thing or doing well, the wrong thing. what happens, right? Like, I, I don't know, my wife and I were talking about Chris Harrison from The Bachelor because he got in some hot water recently for some comments. And we were, you know, had an open discussion about it. And it's like, here's the problem. When someone does try to talk about a, you know, say a very complicated topic, hot button issue like racism or anything like that, right? And then they say something maybe not exactly perfect or not right, and they didn't say it correctly. It's like, now they have to come up with this long, extensive apology. Now they can't do their show anymore and all this kind of stuff where what, what ends up happening as a result of that is it just- No conversation. You know what? I'm not talking about this shit ever publicly. So what happens is it goes under, you know, oh, goes underground. It doesn't go away. It's just not talked about publicly. Matt Damon said it so well because Matt Damon got in hot water for something that boggles my mind. He was just discussing, you know, sexual assault and rape. And he says, you know, there are degrees of it. Like obviously, you know, you know, saying, hey, honey, and slapping her on the butt at work is different than, you know, you know, raping a child or molesting a child or something like that, right? Yeah. And he got shit on for that. And he's like, I'm never going to talk about it again. For making the most obvious, he was like, you can't demean people's experience, and da, 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 like, because they implied that, that he was saying that, you know, one is okay, one is not. He was just saying there are degrees of it, right? Yeah. And he, said it, he said it. And people are not given the benefit of the doubt for their intent often enough. And, you know, they're held to this standard that is impossible this purity contest to like never say something that's not woke. And I'm glad I don't have to live in that world. And I have empathy for those that do live in a spotlight that have to be careful, careful, but we're in a dangerous place with that where these conversations are going to happen and they're better open, right? Cause when you can have the open conversation, then you go, dude, no, that's way out of line, yes. you know, of this. and then the guy can go, Oh, you know what? You're right. Now there's going to be none of that. Cause he's not going to, you know, nobody's going to, you're only going to talk to your bubble. So your bubble is going to agree with you and you'll be like, you know what? That's true. Da, 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 da. Whereas if you had the open discussion with people and it didn't mean you losing your job because, you know, you made a comment that maybe was off colored or whatever, even if you, that's the thing is like, even when you apologize, like Chris Harrison, you know, he worded some things poorly in talking about race and then, you know, he put it on an apology and then he's like, I'm stepping away for, from the show for a little while. I'm like, it's too much, this shit. Like, he Everyone. Could. So we're all just like living in this police state of being afraid of saying anything or doing anything. And you're right. And then it just stifles discussion. And when you stifle discussion, you stifle ideas and exchanges of thoughts. And, and yeah, that's how we grow. That should be how we learn. And I honestly, I'm terrified. You shouldn't, be able to, you shouldn't be afraid to ask a question. 
let's say, for example, you know, I'm, you know, you're, you're in, a ra- in a room with people of different race. Ask a question that's related to racism or something like. But now people, they'll be so scared they don't word it right. Oh, and you think this because of this? And like, no, no, no. Just like I'm asking because I want to know and I want to learn. But I'm too scared, so I'm not going to. You know, and I've even noticed myself like there's certain times I see you know stuff going on on Twitter and I want to chime in. I'm like, nah, don't. You know what? Because it's just gonna open up a can of worms. One hundred percent. I was just talking to my husband about it for the last like seven years or something. I just have completely stayed off of anything even remotely hot button because, unlike you, same thing. I'm not like self, you know, contained or self made. And God forbid I get you know on the wrong side of things, which I'm almost always gonna be on the wrong side of things. And you know that that's it. Then you have to worry about your job. You have to worry about all these things that just like you know. I'm like, okay, is it? Is it that important? No, I guess I'll just shut up and watch everyone else like lose their mind. But the 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 group of people who are saying things, and I don't even I don't even mean to say like unpopular, but who are asking questions, who are asking questions, right? Or maybe so that group of people is getting smaller and smaller. But and even there's a even people when they they speak from ignorance because they just don't know any better and they say it wrong, like they're vilified instead of educated, which is the mistake. Like if you really want to make a positive change for the world in progressive ways and really like make sure that we're more welcoming and inclusive, right? When a 75 year old dealer, you know, who's dealing at the horseshoe says, hey honey, you look beautiful today. Don't vilify him as a freaking sexual assaulting old evil man who's a sexist pig. Just say sweetly to him, he's like, oh, that, you know, that's very sweet of you, but just so you know, we don't say stuff like that no more because it's kind of like makes women, and he'll be like, I'm so sorry. Do you think this man's intent was to demean? No, but like, he does that once and people are like, you know, claws at him. That's, that's got to change. It, it's, it's sad. I, when I see it, it's sad. And it's just lacking in empathy. Like just recognizing that other people also have different ways they were raised or different opinions. And it's okay for other people to have different opinions. The whole world doesn't have to agree or act the same or fall into the same box. If, if you really are so sure that how you believe is right, it should be fine for other people to not believe that because you can just keep doing what you're doing and you keep doing you and being right in whatever you're doing. Yeah, and no, I do I, think that. What I would suggest is this. If you are one of those people who, you know, want the world to be more progressive and, you know, woke or whatever, for lack of a better term, and if that's your genuine goal, right, what is the most effective strategy to get there, right? Is it, A, is it A, be militant, point out every mistake everybody makes, vilify them and try to cancel them and rid the, rid the world of those people, or B, when people do speak out of turn, or, you know, in something that you say, have the, you know, have the decency to explain to them calmly why, you know, that's kind of out of line or whatever. And maybe they won't agree with you in some spots, but that's a way to move the needle towards this. This militant idea of like, it's, you know, you're either perfect or you're, 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 you're an awful human being. Human beings are complicated. As I was talking about before, we all have different aspects of my personality. There's some parts of myself that I really like, and there's other parts that I wish, you know, didn't show his ugly head as often. But such is life. I got to accept who I am and constantly try to work towards being, you know, the best version of myself, but I'm never going to be perfect. No, neither are you or anybody listening. So let's stop trying to put forth tests that are unpassable by any human being in the world. And let us just be our real, awful, terrible, wonderful (laughs) selves, please. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I'm so glad to talk to you. I was, honestly, I was kind of sad when I thought I wasn't gonna be able to do this interview. It's been too long. We have to be catching up at least once a year. We basically missed a whole entire year because because of the Rona and I, really look forward to i hope having a cocktail with you and your wife i don't even know that i've seen you guys together since you've been married i think we would have a really good cocktail hour so pencil it in hashtag in the future hashtag not blessed hashtag get shit housed and just like go crazy and You'll yeah appreciate it thank sure. you so much for taking the time it was a pleasure as always <laughs>